his squire Sancho sent after him, warning him that most certainly they were windmills and not giants he was going to attack. He, however, was so positive they were giants that he neither heard the cries of Sancho nor perceived, near as he was, what they were. Fly not, cowards and vile beings, he shouted, for a single knight attacks you. A slight breeze at this moment sprang up, and the great veins began to move. The arms of the windmill. Though ye flourish more arms than the giant Priarius, ye have to reckon with me, exclaimed Don Quixote when he saw this. So saying, he commended himself with all his heart to his lady Dulcinea, imploring her to support him in such a peril. With lance braced and covered by his shield, he charged at Rosinante's fullest gallop and attacked the first mill that stood in front of him. But as he drove his lance point into the sail, the wind whirled it around with such force that it shivered the lance to pieces. 1215. It swept away with it, horse and rider, and they were sent rolling over the plain in sad condition indeed. Sancho hastened to his assistance as fast as the animal could go. When he came up, he found Don Quixote unable to move, with such an impact at Rosinante falling with him. God bless me, said Sancho. Did I not tell your worship to watch what you were doing because they were only windmills? No one could have made any mistake about it unless he had something of the same kind in his head. Silence, friend Sancho, replied Don Quixote. The fortunes of war, more than any other, are liable to frequent fluctuations. Moreover, I think, and it is the truth, that that same sage, Freston, who carried off my study and books, has turned these giants into mills in order to rob me of the glory of vanquishing them, such is the enmity he bears me. But... In the end, his wicked arts will avail but little against my good sword. God's will be done, said Sancho Panza, and helping him to rise, got him up again on Rocinante, whose shoulder was half dislocated. Then discussing the adventure, they followed the road to Puerto Lapis, for there, said Don Quixote, they could not fail to find adventures in abundance and variety as it was a well-traveled thoroughfare. For all that, he was much grieved at the loss of his lance, and said so to his squire. I remember having read, he added, how a Spanish knight, Diego Perez de Vargas by name, having broken his sword in battle, tore from an oak a ponderous bough or branch. With it he did such things that day and pounded so many moors that he got the surname of Machuca. And he and his descendants from that day forth were called Vargas y Machuca. I mention this because from the first oak I see I mean to tear such a branch, large and stout. I am determined and resolved to do such deeds with it that you may deem yourself very fortunate in being found worthy to see them and be an eyewitness of things that will scarcely be believed. Be that as God wills, said Sancho. I believe it all as your worship says it. But straighten yourself a little, for you seem to be leaning to one side, maybe from the shaking you got when you fell. 1216. That is the truth, said Don Quixote. And if I make no complaint of the pain, it is because knights errant are not permitted to complain of any wound, even though their bowels be coming out through it. If so, said Sancho, I have nothing to say. But God knows I would rather your worship complained when anything ailed you. For my part, I confess I must complain, however small the ache may be. Unless this rule about not complaining applies to the squires of knights errant also. Don Quixote could not help laughing at his squire's simplicity and assured him he might complain whenever and however he chose, just as he liked. 
So far, he had never read of anything to the contrary in the order of knighthood. Sancho reminded him it was dinner time, to which his master answered that he wanted nothing himself just then, but that Sancho might eat when he had a mind. With this permission, Sancho settled himself as comfortably as he could on his beast, and taking out of the saddlebags what he had stowed away in them, he jogged along behind his master, munching slowly. From time to time, he took a pull at the wineskin with all the enjoyment that the thirstiest tavern keeper in Malaga might have envied. And while he went on in this way, between gulps, he never gave a thought to any of the promises his master had made him, nor did he rate it as hardship, but rather as recreation, going in quest of adventures, however dangerous they might be. All right, uh, the passage of chapter 8 of Don Quixote, the novel Don Quixote, is of course one of the most famous. Well, uh, let's just, at level one really quickly, let's just remind. So uh, Don Quixote looks up and he sees windmills. And he says, yes, I have monsters to fight against. And Sancho Panza, who lives in the real world and can only see windmills, says, uh, those are only windmills. To which, Sancho, uh, to which uh, Don Quixote says, look, if you're afraid, then I'll go fight him myself. And he runs off on his pony, the old nag, and he sticks his lance into the arm of one of the windmills, which of course just picks it up because the wind is blowing it, shatters his lance and knocks him off, uh, knocks, knocks him about, knocks him out. By the way, this happens a lot where Don Quixote basically gets jacked over and over again, right? Of course, Sancho Panza comes up and he, you know, he says, I told you they were windmills. And then immediately Don, uh, Don Quixote says, they got changed into windmills by my adversary. They were actually monsters. In other words, the, po the point that's being made here and ridiculed by Cervantes is you cannot tell true believers anything. They won't believe it because their minds are already made up. And he, of course, knows he has been fighting against legit monsters. Oh, on, on, to, on to page 12, 16, of course, to end this, Notice, you have Sancho Panza uh, um, talking about, you know, living in the real world. I'm hungry, uh, or I think I'm going to complain when it hurts, but Don Quixote, unwilling to ever complain. No complaining, just take your punishment like a man and go on to the next adventure. And that's exactly how the text Don Quixote works. I hope that you'll be interested in picking it up and reading it on your own. Let's work it 2A really quickly, a possible message or theme. Well, one is obviously that... These stories that we're so interested in can actually be not good but bad. That is to say, stories about heroes can lead somebody to do crazy things like going out and trying to emulate them and in the process causing themselves and a lot of other people, Don Quixote causes a lot of other people pain as well, cause a lot of pain. Right? Another, another possible message here is that there's something beautiful about a true believer who just won't, it won't accept reality because he lives in this world of the imagination. And as Einstein said, the imagination is more important than knowledge. And to that degree, you have to kind of celebrate somebody who can live with that level of imaginative hope, we might say. At Tubi, of course, the parody is obvious here. We are making fun of all kinds of things from the ancient, that is to say, the classic texts of knight chivalry, knight errants, and all of that, to, as well, Cervantes in his own time, making fun of the ways in which people kind of believe things that are clearly insane, and yet they buy them, they believe them, and you can't change their minds. At 3A, what is for you the texts that come to mind? Obviously, the Odyssey and the Aeneid come to mind, the Iliad, the classic epics come to mind of, of Odysseys, of journeys, of fighting, of chivalry, of all of that. What is for you a text that plays the game, though, of things are not what they appear, where you have somebody in the, in the text who thinks life is one way, and you and everybody else knows, yeah, that's not actually the way it is at all. Finally, at 3B, to what degree are you a little bit like Don Quixote? That is to say, you're a hopeless idealist and you believe in things even if all the facts on the ground are otherwise. To what degree are you like Sancho Panza, who kind of looks at, looks at situations and goes, you know, I, I got to take things for face value of what, what, what really is going on here. I can't just make this up in my mind. If you thought of yourself as more one or the other, which one of the two would you probably say you most are? And finally, when was a time that you fought windmills? That is to say, obviously, metaphorically, you fought windmills. Um, remember our story of Sisyphus who pushes his rock up the hill in, in Hades and then it rolls back over him all the way down? 
this will be Don Quixote all the way through the text. He's always doing these things, but they never work out for him. And yet, he's always ready to go on to the next to the next one. What was a time in your in your life when you kind of you know you thought you were doing something really important, but looking back on it, you were like, oh man, I was totally fighting windmills, thinking they were thinking they were monsters. And somebody, maybe somebody in my life, told me like Sancho telling Don Quixote, yeah, this is this is not what's going on, but you didn't want to believe it. Well, I hope that you'll be interested in picking up Cervantes' Don Quixote and reading it for yourself. Wonderful stuff. Thank you.